Nearly 2,000 years ago, a man was born on this earth, and that man changed this world. Um, this is the month of December, uh, the year 2022, and many people uh, celebrate a holiday called Christmas in which they remember this man's birth. The man, of course, is Jesus Christ. And uh, the people who celebrate his birth are very ignorant of a lot of things. They understand that Jesus Christ came to the earth and he died on the cross. Draw it like this. He died on the cross, but they don't understand the titles that he had when he was here. Okay, that's obviously not what the cross looked like. A little bit disproportionate, but I'm trying to make a point here. He uh, came and he took a title. And that title was the Son of Man. And yet the reality was he was a son of God. You see, the Jews had a promised Messiah that was going to come. And that Messiah would take up the throne of David, a physical, literal, visible throne on the earth. And he would rule as the son of man. But the reality is that this would not be just an ordinary man that's born of a woman. This man is born of a virgin. Um, and he is the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. He's the son of God. Okay. Um, and today in this study, it's going to be very detailed, two-part study, a lot of scripture to go through, a very deep study. And I'm going to be talking about the sixth and seventh kingdoms of Jesus Christ. Okay, this son of man position right here, he is going to set up the sixth kingdom. And we'll talk about it as we go through this study. Over here, the Son of God, when He is done ruling and reigning on the earth, He's going to set up the seventh kingdom. And I'm going to show you all the scriptures that support this. I'm not making this up. Okay? You see, right now, I believe we are in the fifth kingdom mentioned in the book of Daniel. We'll be going there in just a few minutes. And after the fifth kingdom, a new kingdom is set up by the Son of God returning as the Son of Man with that unique title, Son of Man, to rule and reign on a throne, physical throne on the earth from the city of Jerusalem, the city of the great king. Hmm. But this is the kingdom that will be set up. And after 1,000 years, this kingdom, the eternal kingdom, is going to be set up. Now let me show you what prompted this study. I had a comment here. I have it printed out but I'll be putting it up on screen for you. Um, <clears throat> Dana Ashley writes here, if your beliefs are true that there are only five kingdoms of men, that would mean that our eternal kingdom, our forever home, New Jerusalem, that comes after Christ destroys the Daniel 2 statue, that would mean that our kingdom with the Father and His Son would come on the sixth kingdom. Not true. He would never use the sixth as a number of finality. He uses 12 multiples of 12, seven as a number of completion, and ten, but never six. You are correct about Rome being the worst and the most powerful, but they are the beast, not the whore. Uh, she's wrong on that last part there. I could cover that in another study. I might make a mention of that but uh, in this study here. But I want to talk about the thing of the clear up the confusion. If there's the fifth kingdom, Jesus Christ destroys it, and then he sets up eternal, you know, heavenly kingdom. Uh, no. Jesus sets up a thousand year kingdom on the earth first before he sets up this seventh kingdom here. And six is the biblical number for what? A man. Son of man. What is the seven the number of? God. So you have the seventh kingdom being for the Son of God, the sixth kingdom being for the Son of man. Jesus Christ is promised to rule on the earth in a physical capacity. All right, and many people aren't even aware of this very glorious kingdom that is coming to the earth. See, we're all looking forward to heaven. If you're saved, you understand the glories of heaven and the, the wonderful future that's there. But the reality is, it isn't just that. It's also going to be here on the earth. 1,000 years 
where the devil is bound in the bottomless pit for 1,000 years. Hmm. So let's start out here. Um, let me write a few other things down here quickly so I can get this. Um, we'll go write things down as we go through the study, I'm saying. This one is 1,000 years on earth. This kingdom over here is eternal in new, let me see if I can fit this on, Jerusalem. <laughs> Sorry, I had to really squeeze it on there. It's eternal in new Jerusalem. This one is 1,000 years on the earth. Okay, they're not the same. All right, so we'll continue here. Let's turn first in our King James Bibles to the book of Daniel, chapter 2. Now, this is the kind of study that you really need to have a Bible and you really need to follow along. I know a lot of people, as I've said many times, a lot of people will listen to my preaching while doing dishes or driving someplace. Obviously, you can't be turning in your King James Bible um, when you're doing that, I get it, okay? I've listened to plenty of audio sermons over the years. It's how I learned a lot of the Bible um, from some great men that came before me. But it's very important that at some point in time you have contact with the physical King James Bible. Um, and you can actually read the scriptures. And uh, if you actually study the King James Bible too, I have to add, you can listen to guys, you know, 100 years ago that were preaching and uh, they're preaching, they'll read the King James Bible, and it's the same words. Okay, there's no Mandela effect. The King James Bible's not being changed by occultists. All right, that's nonsense. Don't ever fall for that. It's a stupid lie that was designed by a witch. Fiona Broom was her name. We did a whole video debunking that, so you can see that. But uh, this is your authority, not me. Okay, so always follow along in your King James Bible. Never trust a preacher that is afraid to hold a Bible in his hands and afraid to have you look at a Bible. The, one of the quickest ways that you can tell that you're dealing with a false prophet is they will not tell you to turn in your Bible. They'll say the Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says, but they won't say turn in your Bible and look at what it says. So important. But let's start out here. We'll see about the five kingdoms. Daniel chapter 2, beginning in verse 31 uh, it says here, Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image, this great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. Uh, this image, image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them, and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Filled the whole earth. Sixth kingdom is what it's talking about. I mean, if it's going into heaven, you have the fifth kingdom being destroyed there, the part of, you know, the ten toes, part of iron, part of miry clay. If that's destroyed, then you go to eternal heaven, New Jerusalem. Why would it say it filled the whole earth? Because it's not filling heaven, it's filling the earth, the sixth kingdom. All right. Uh, verse 36. This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. It's kind of funny because it's just Daniel standing there, you know. Why does he say we will tell the interpretation? Because he means him and the Lord, the Holy Spirit. Um, Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven hath he given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces, and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. 
And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. Which we will see here as we continue. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. Now, you could do huge amounts of studies and sermons and whatever just on these passages of Scripture. All right? There's a lot of different ways that you can interpret this and look at this and everything else, certainly. But if you look at the true historical way that things are interpreted, the head is the ancient uh, Babylonian system. Okay, that was the very first world government. All right. After that came the Media Persian um, kingdom, which was represented by silver. The brass was represented by ancient Greece. Iron is the iron legions of Rome. But it's interesting because when gold goes away, it goes away. It's not gold mixed with silver. Silver goes away. It's not silver mixed with brass. Brass goes away. It's not brass mixed with iron. But yet, the fourth kingdom merges into the fifth kingdom. Iron goes to being merged with iron and miry clay. What is clay in scripture? Well, man was formed out of the dust of the earth. God breathes into his nostrils the breath of life. Chemically, we are very similar. Our flesh is very similar to clay, all right? As far as chemical composition is concerned. Obviously, we live and the clay does not. But my point is, you have this thing of the Roman the iron being mixed with miry clay. It's part strong, part weak. Well, what do we see about the Catholic Church? You say, what the Catholic Church? Bear with me. What is the Catholic Church called? It's the Roman Catholic Church. And you have the ancient Roman Empire, the ancient legions of Rome and Caesar and all the other stuff. And in the fourth century, you have Constantine and he takes um, Imperial Rome, which is basically divided into two kingdoms, Hmm, two legs? Yeah, exactly. Two kingdoms, and he makes it into no longer, it's, it's no longer imperial Rome, it's now spiritual Rome. It's no longer the um, supreme, or pontificus maximus, it's now the supreme pontiff. You see, it's no longer Julius Caesar, now it's the Pope. And if you think that the Catholic Church does not have military power, you are seriously mistaken. Look at the knighthoods, the Knights of Malta, the Knights of... Uh, Columbus, the Knights of the Equestrian Order, um, the Knights Templar, the Knights Hospitaller, the, you just go down through, there's all the different knighthoods. And these guys are put into rich, powerful positions. And sometimes they're very strong. You go through the Dark Ages and they're persecuting people and putting people to death, burning them at the stake, torturing them and whatever else, if they go against the Catholic Church. Other times they're a little bit weak. Protestant Reformation comes out, Catholics turned against their own system, said we're protesting it and we want to reform Catholicism. It wasn't that they were abandoning Catholicism, they just wanted to reform it. But what happened? Because of the schism there within the Catholic Church, the Protestants and the Catholics broke off. Now they're having internal fighting and all this other stuff and they have you know, the Reformation and now you have the Counter-Reformation with the Jesuit order. So, And you look at powerful men in position or positions of power, you know, um, Donald Trump, trained by Jesuits at Fordham University. Joe Biden, the current uh, supposed president of America, yeah, right, the guy, you know, can barely uh, string a sentence together. He's not the president. He's a, he's a puppet. He's a figurehead. But Joe Biden has been given um, honorary degrees from Jesuit schools, okay? So the Jesuits are in control of things. Anthony Fauci, Jesuit educated. Um, uh, Robert Redfield, Jesuit educated. You just look down, you go down through the list of all these different people. Andy Cuomo, you know, Jesuit educated. Uh, Gavin Newsom, Jesuit educated. Just all these different people. They're all involved in the Counter-Reformation to bring all people back under that alt-right, right-wing 
fascist Catholic system, or if you want to get into the, into the monastic orders, then you can go to communist, communistic Catholicism, or communal living, in other words. Get a hold of that. Um, but this system, it's part strong, part weak. And what you have is you have the, all this fighting with Catholicism, and then the true body of Christ is outside of that whole system. We're just called heretics. All right, We're not Protestant. We're not Catholic. We're outside of that system. So we are battling that thing all the time and trying to get bring things to light and whatever else. And when we do, sometimes the Catholic Church, it's too early for them to be putting people to death. So they kind of have to back off and, oh, no, no, we're, you know, we're okay with people. And you can read the Bible and everything else. Um, the Bible was forbidden to be read by Catholics all throughout the Dark Ages. That's why it was the Dark Ages. And they just, no, you're not reading it. And then it was, okay, well, people started to bring out the, you know, the heretics started to bring out, you know, Bibles and whatever else. And then the Catholics, some of the Protestants started to say, these Catholic priests that started a protest room, then they started to say, you know what, I think we should get the Bible into the hands of the common man. You had John Wycliffe, one of the first that came out with an English translation. Then you have, of course, William Tyndale and Miles Coverdale and, you know, a lot of the others, Martin Luther in Germany. And they're all saying, you know what, as Catholics, we think that the laity should be given Bibles in their own tongue, that they can understand the scriptures and, and judge what's going on for themselves. We believe in personal liberty. And it's so funny today, you have the vast majority of people, atheists especially, and they come out and they rail on the Bible, the Bible's a book of fairy tales and everything else, and they don't even realize that the very freedom that they so enjoy actually goes back to the great enlightenment, the, the people being given the Bible in their own language. I mean, what were the printing presses printing at first? You know, Superman comic books? No, they printed Bibles, the Gutenberg Press. They printed Bibles, uh, not the works of Aldous Huxley or, you know, Bertrand Russell or something. No, the Bible brings freedom, all right? And you say, oh, organized religion. Organized religion isn't supported by Scripture. If you actually would read the Bible, you'd realize that. But, so this kingdom that's there, and you could debate this back and forth. I would not part company over, you know, somebody says, well, I think the fourth kingdom is dissolved in the fourth century when the Roman Empire kind of dissolved. And, you know, yes, it did. You know, the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church kind of took on some of the features of it. And yeah, you can make some arguments, but I really think we're waiting for the fifth kingdom. The fifth kingdom's yet in the future will be established by the Antichrist. Well, you could make that argument, but I believe that we've been in the fifth kingdom um, for nearly 2,000, well, not quite 2,000 years, it would be, what, um, you know, 1,700 years or so, round about there. We've been in the fifth kingdom, under it for a long time. And um, the kings that show up are, they show up in the book of Revelation, and they're sort of the end of this whole kingdom thing. Jesus Christ sets up his kingdom on the earth. After that, the thousand-year kingdom on the earth. So if there's five kingdoms mentioned, and then Jesus Christ sets up his kingdom and it fills the, it's a great mountain and it fills the whole earth. What number is that? It's number six. And where this Dana, Ashley, I thank you for your comment. But where you messed up is thinking that we go from fifth kingdom right into eternity, which would have to be the seventh kingdom. Not so. There's a kingdom that you missed in between there. All right. Um, and a lot of people don't know that. A lot of people, again, Christmas time is here. Jesus came and he was born on Christmas Day or something like this, which, you know, isn't supported by Scripture. I get that. Somebody wants to celebrate the birth of Christ at this time of the year because of it's part of their, their ancestral traditions or whatever. Fine. Not a problem. The Bible talks about Romans 14. We're not supposed to argue. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind about esteeming one day above another. It's fine. People make too big of a deal about it. But most people that think of Christmas being the day that Jesus was born, they don't understand the full picture of things. You say, well, what about his sixth kingdom and the seventh kingdom? They'd say, the what? You know, I don't know what that is. Um, it's very important. The sixth kingdom and the seventh kingdom. The Jews, uh, the Jewish people, they reject Jesus Christ as their Messiah because he didn't set up this kingdom on the earth his first time. Uh, well, if you would actually read the scriptures, you would understand why that happened. We'll be going through some of that today in this study. So, very important to get that. Matthew chapter 21. Let's go to the New Testament now. To the book of Matthew.
You know, and you can say, well, you're, you're bigoted, you're mean-spirited, you're Catholic hate crime and all, you know, whatever. Um, I'm just stating facts, okay? Uh, there are facts that can be proven from history. The Roman Catholic Church, you go back through, it's been spiritual and temporal swords that they have had. That's what their official doctrine teaches. It isn't some kind of a thing of just some narrow-minded, bigoted interpretation that I have. The Catholic Church believes that they have total power over the earth. That's why the Vatican flag has two keys on it, the keys of the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. They have two swords, the spiritual and the temporal. All right, It's very important to understand that. The Catholic Church is not just a church, it's a religion or something else. No, it's a world power. Um, the pandemic that happened back there in 2020 and whatever going on, that was an interdict, a papal interdict. Well, again, we prove that. That's, the, the Pope was the one that was pulling the strings there and saying, shut the churches down, shut the businesses down, do this other stuff. They're bringing in some big stuff right now. They're going to start to flex their muscles now. That iron is coming back. The part strong, part weak, it's going to be part strong now. The strong arm tactics of the Vatican are going to start coming back. That's why we all need to pray about it. If you love freedom, you better start praying. Matthew chapter 21, verse 33 Here another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard, remember the vineyard for later, and hedged it round about and, dot, and digged a wine press to it or in it and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandmen took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. But last of all, he sent unto them his son. His son, saying, They will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and let us seize on his inheritance. <laughs> um, okay, stop there for a minute. This is the inheritance, ruling and reigning from Jerusalem. And the Jews in the first century were saying, hmm, we can conspire with Rome that we are under subjection to, and we can have our city back, um, but we just have to kind of agree with some concessions and whatever else there, you know. Uh, you remember if, you know, you remember when Jesus is being put to death and Pilate says, you know, behold your king, and they said what? What did the Jews say in Scripture? We have no king but Caesar. They're being ruled by Rome, you see. They were in the fourth kingdom at that point in time. Um, verse 39, And they called him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. Died on the cross, in other words. When the Lord thereof, or therefore of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? They say unto him, He will miserably, miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall re render him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus, let's see where am I reading to here? Um, Jesus saith unto them, Did ye never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same has become the head of the corner. Also remember that. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I unto you, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever, whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. What we read back there, stone cut out without hands, and it smashes the image of the toes, and they become like the chaff of the threshing floor. Grind on the powder. See what's going on? And when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard his parables, they perceived that he spake of them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude, because they took him for a prophet. Jesus Christ was a prophet, but he was also God. It's not just this thing of Islam, what they teach, that Jesus was just one of the prophets. Muhammad was the greatest prophet. Jesus was kind of a lesser prophet. <laughs> I don't think so. Jesus Christ was fully God. We'll talk about that too. God manifests in the flesh, and the Bible does teach that. All right, Mark chapter 12. Go next to Mark chapter 12. <clears throat> Read a similar thing here. Very important to understand this. Mark chapter 12, verse 1, down through verse 12. 
And he began to speak unto them by parables. A certain man planted a vineyard, and set an hedge about it, and digged a place for the wine fat, and built a tower, and let it out to husbandmen, <clears throat> and went into a far country. And at the season he sent to the husbandmen a servant, that he might receive from the husbandmen of the fruit of the vineyard. And they called him, and beat him, and sent him away empty. And again he sent unto them another servant, and at him they cast stones, and wounded him in the head, and sent him away shamefully handled. And again he sent another, and him they killed, and many others, beating some and killing some. Having yet therefore one son, his well-beloved, he sent him also last unto them, saying, They will reverence my son. But those husbandmen said among themselves, This is the heir, come, let us kill him, and the inheritance shall be ours. And they took him and killed him, and cast him out of the vineyard. What shall therefore the Lord of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the husbandmen, and will give the vineyard unto others. And have ye not read this scripture? The stone which the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And they sought to lay, hand, or to lay hold on him, but feared the people, for they knew that he had spoken the parable against them, and they left him and went their way. Again, <clears throat> these Jews, down through the centuries, have been subjected to these different kingdoms. And guess what? They still are today. And I get so sick and tired of these idiots out there, these anti-Semitic idiots that come out and they try to say that the Jews run everything. <laughs> oh, please, show me one time where Jews are giving awards or commendations or whatever to Catholic priests or bishops. It never happens. But flip it. <clears throat> I can show you time after time where Jews are receiving awards from the Catholic Church. Your night of this and special you know, thing of this and whatever else. The Jews are subservient to the Vatican. They always have been. All right? <clears throat> and the modern day state of Israel exists only because the Pope allowed it to happen. Luke chapter 20. Not saying that the Pope was for it, openly for it, whatever, but uh, the Catholic Church has a hand over there. The most holy temple of the Knights of the Equestrian Order, um, the, I forget what it's called, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre or something like that, um, it's over in Jerusalem, and the Catholic Church owns a lot of real estate in Jerusalem because it's uh, their Fort Antonia is where the, the supposed Temple Mount is. That's not there. It's down in the city of David. That's a whole other study. Um, but uh, the Catholic Church, that's their real estate there. And when that third Antichrist Temple was built and they put their uh, Christ in there, um, it's going to be the Catholic Church that runs things. And this covenant that's confirmed between the Antichrist and the Jews, not between the Jews and the Muslims. That's nonsense. There's no scripture for that. Okay, it's between the Antichrist, the Catholic Church, in other words, and the Jews. Again, I've proved that from other studies. A lot of scripture to go over if you want to look at the proof of all of that. Luke chapter 20, excuse me, verse 9, down through verse 19. <clears throat> then began he to speak to the people this parable. A certain man planted a vineyard and led it forth to husbandmen and went into a far country for a long time. And at the season he sent a servant to the husbandmen that they should give him of the fruit of the vineyard. But the husbandmen beat him and sent him away empty. And again he sent another servant and they beat him also and entreated him shamefully and sent him away empty. And again he sent a third and they wounded him also and cast him out. All right. Now, let me just fill this whole thing in for you here. Why didn't Jesus come and set up the kingdom for the first time? Why, you know, he wasn't the Messiah because he didn't do this thing the first time. Um, he's explaining to them why he didn't, why he's not going to be setting up this kingdom while he's here on the earth. Okay. The reason for it is because God sent his prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and he's sending them all these servants coming and prophesying and saying, you need to turn from your wickedness. You need to turn from your sin. And what are they doing? They're beating them. They're killing them. We have no king but Caesar. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, he'll be our king. And then the media Persian, then the Greece, you know, the Greek empire. We'll, we'll worship all of those guys. Oh, here comes a prophet of God. Oh, Kill that guy. Shut up. Don't talk to us about our sins. Shut up. And finally, the Lord says, I'm going to send my son, the son of God, appearing as the son of man. He's here to bring the kingdom. Will you accept him? 
This is the heir. Here's the son of God. Get him. Let's kill him. I don't want him messing up our relationship we have with Rome, you see, our current boss. That's why the Lord didn't set up his kingdom the first time. He's explaining it to them. And the Jews of today, they say, oh, I reject Jesus. And I think, well, then you're still the same people. And you deserve what's coming to you in the time of Jacob's trouble. <clears throat> Verse 13. Then said the Lord of the vineyard, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son. It may be they will reverence him when they see him. Um, you're only supposed to reverence God, okay, in terms of, you know, holy and reverend or his name. You should never take the name reverend for a title for a man or a woman, you know. But uh, they should reverence him. Why? God is manifest in the flesh. That's why. When they knew God, they glorified him not as God. It says about in Romans chapter 1. Hmm. You're supposed to reverence the Son of God. He might look like the Son of Man to sinful people, but he's in reality the Son of God. <clears throat> Verse 14, But when the husbandmen saw him, they reasoned among themselves, saying, This is the heir, come let us kill him, that the inheritance may be ours. So they cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. What therefore shall the Lord of the vineyard do unto them? He shall come and destroy these husbandmen, and shall give the vineyard to others. And when they heard it, they said, God forbid. And he beheld them and said, What is this then that is written? The stone which the builders rejected, the seam has become the head of the corner. Whosoever shall fall upon that stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. Um, <clears throat> you know, one of the requirements of salvation, it's not just, well, you just believe. Uh, no, um, the requirement is you have to be broken. You have to come to the end of your self-righteousness. You can't say, well, I'm a good person, but, you know, I'll just pray this prayer and I believe Jesus died for me or whatever else. And, I, you know, I don't really need to be broken and whatever. That's not salvation. Salvation is you come to the stone there and you're broken. You fall upon Jesus Christ. You fall down before the cross and you say, oh, God, my life is a mess and it's a wreck and whatever. And you fall down before the Lord and you are broken. And then he fixes you. He gives you new life. You're born again. And if you're not born again, you're not saved. <laughs> There's no changed life. It didn't take. And I've told that to many people down through the years. You have to come to terms with the fact you could be a false convert. I was a false convert for many years. Living a very wicked life, but I went to church on Sunday. I was raised in a Christian home. Just as wicked as any other lost person out there. That's why lost people, by the way, there's so many hypocrites in the church because they're not true converts. They never came to the stone that the builders rejected. The builders of the kingdom trying to build that kingdom there on the earth, headquartered in Jerusalem. Um, <clears throat> hey, let's get this thing together. Hey, let's make this temple. Let's, let's build this thing here. Uh, Jesus says, hey, uh, can I be part of this? No, get out of here. We don't want you. Uh, you know what? On second thought, no, I want Jesus, but uh, I think we're going to make him, we'll have to remake Jesus. We'll make him this skinny little, skinny little thing on the cross uh, and then curve the top of the cross, a little crooked staff, you know, and the Pope walks around with a sickly little uh, emaciated Jesus dying on the thing. Or we'll make him this, you know, whatever, New Age Christ and whatever else. That's what people do. Or we'll make him the little dear baby Jesus, you know, in the manger. And if you do good deeds, then the Christ child comes back at Christmas time. You know, Christkind in German, you know, and, and he comes and, and it, you know, whenever you do a good deed, you can have some straw and you can put it in the manger and then he'll come back and give you presents and a Christmas tree for Christmas or something. Um, the Jesus isn't a child anymore. <laughs> but, you know, that's what people want. But the real Jesus, the Jesus that appears in this King James Bible, oh no, I don't want that. I don't even want to say the name Jesus. It has to be Yeshua or Yahushua or Yahawashi or Yamaha or something else. Um, that's what people do. It's the stone which the builders rejected. You understand? The stone, the foundation of the church, not Peter. We'll get into that as we continue. It's the stone which the builders rejected. 
That's what these people reject. Where we want to bring in the kingdom, we want to have that thousand-year Reich on the earth, Reich being kingdom, R-E-I-C-H, like Hitler was trying to do, the thousand-year Reich. But Jesus, the stone that appears in Scripture, no, keep him out of here. No, sorry, we don't want that. We're going to bring in the kingdom without the king. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, <clears throat> you know, Jesus should have been here and he should have brought in the kingdom, you know, back there in the first century. How could he when you threw him out of the vineyard and you, and you killed him? All the things that the Lord did for the Jewish people and their king comes. All the prophets came there killing them and beating them and all kinds of things. Here comes the Son of God to take on the position of the Son of Man. There's the heir. Kill him. Then they kill him, and then they spend the next nearly 2,000 years. We didn't see the Messiah. I don't know where the Messiah is at. There's no Messiah around here. <laughs> oh, boy. You're in trouble. If you're a Jew, a Jesus Christ rejecting Jew, you're in serious trouble. Because it doesn't even make any sense why you rejected him. Psalm 80. <clears throat> and I know that there's some Jews that are open-minded and they'll listen and whatever, but a lot of them are arrogant jerks. And they have some rough stuff coming. Psalm 80, verse 14 through 19. Return, we beseech thee, O God of hosts. Look down from heaven and behold and visit this vine. Hmm. And the vineyard which thy right hand hath planted. All things were created by Jesus Christ, and by him all things consist. Huh. And the branch that thou madest strong for thyself. Hmm. It is burned with fire, it is cut down, they perish at the rebuke of thy countenance. <laughs> Amazing. The nation of Israel there, it's burned with fire, it's broken, it's, it's destroyed, because the Lord has to continually rebuke them. Look at the whole Old Testament, read through it. Verse 17, let thy hand be upon the man of thy right hand, upon the son of man, there's the title, whom thou madest strong for thyself. Huh, a body hast thou prepared for me. Jesus Christ takes on the likeness of sinful flesh. He didn't come in sinful flesh. He's not fully man. You know, that's, there's no term in scripture, fully man, or, or especially fully human, okay, no term at all like that. He took on the likeness of sinful flesh, but it was not sinful flesh like you and I have. All right? Um, he knew no sin. There was no iniquity with Jesus Christ. There was no guile in his mouth. Never thought an un impure thought, never said an uh, corrupt thing, perverted thing, whatever else. He knew no sin. So don't say that Jesus is fully man and fully God. There's no scripture for that. Son of man... And Son of God, yeah, there's scripture for that. We're looking at it right now. And we'll be seeing it as we go through this study. But there's no fully man and fully God. That's another Trinitarian satanic attack on the Lord Jesus Christ. Try to make it that God the Father is up in heaven and you know the Holy Spirit's a little bird that's floating around. And then Jesus has his own body, soul, spirit separate from the person of the Father. There's no scripture for that. None. It's a satanic teaching. You have two different beings, each claiming the title of God. And the birdie, and I guess he can claim it too if he can talk. If you give him a cracker, I guess. You know, Polly wants a cracker, you know, like a parrot. It's a little joke there, sorry. <laughs> um, verse 17, Let thy hand be upon the man of thy right hand, upon the son of man whom thou madest strong for thyself. So will not we go back from thee, quicken us, and we will call upon thy name. Hmm, necessary for salvation. Turn us again, O Lord God of hosts. Cause thy face to shine and we shall be saved. Oh boy. <laughs> that little portion of scripture there, I could do a huge study. You could write a book on that little bit of scripture right there. But I love the, the verse there, 19. Cause thy face to shine and we shall be saved. You know what's interesting? What the New Testament teaches? We're not going to go there, but you can look this up. The Bible talks about the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Hmm. Approaching unto the light which no man can approach unto. God the Father is the soul. He's the light that comes out. Whom no man hath seen nor can see. 
you can't see a soul, the soul of God the Father there. What you see is the face of Jesus Christ. So when you get to heaven and you see God there, you're seeing Jesus Christ. You say, but what, okay, but what about the thing of the Son of God is on the right hand of the Father? Yes, because there's a reason for that. The same thing is when you see souls under the altar in Revelation chapter 6, and they're saying, avenge our blood on the earth. There's a separation between their body, which is down there, that's been killed, and the soul, which is in heaven. The soul in heaven is the Father. The body is Jesus Christ. And they are separated. You might say the Father has his uh, right-hand man. The right hand is separated from the Father until this is done. Okay? This is the right hand of God. All right? Very deep stuff here, okay? But please understand, I'm not speaking anything heretical. I've done all the studies to prove what I'm saying. I have a whole study on the right hand. Why is Jesus seated at the right hand of God? Whole big thing. Go through all the scriptures. There's a lot of them, all right? Well, this is not stuff that you're going to get in church buildings, okay? They're lost. Church buildings are for teaching lost people religious things, okay? You always remember that. What we're talking about here is some very deep stuff. And... Jesus Christ has a purpose where he is going to rule and reign on the earth for 1,000 years. And he is separated, his body is separated from the soul. They can come together, of course, but they are separate in heaven. You see him standing at the right hand of God until this is done. And I'll show you the scriptures in this study. All right, let's go next to John 15. Back to the New Testament, the book of John, chapter 15. John, chapter 15, verse 1 through 8. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Hmm, well, man, husband, man, not men. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, and ye, excuse me, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. Very true. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. Oh, I love Jesus. I, I just think Jesus is my Savior. Oh, he's, he's wonderful to me. What do you think about the King James Bible? Oh, that, that book, I, you know, it has some nice stuff. Yeah, I just, that's a problem. That's a big problem. This is the greatest book that's ever been written on the earth, the King James Version, the Authorized Version, whatever you want to call it. Originally called the Authorized Version, later nicknamed the King James Version. But the, because King James authorized the translation of it, said, I'll protect you while you're making the translation for seven years. All right, seven years. Hmm. Seven, there. Yeah, God's number. But the whole point I'm trying to make here is, um, if you remember the vineyard and the vine and the branches, right there you're seeing it. And Jesus is explaining it. So you get these people and they come along and they say, um, you know, we're saved and we're whatever else, but yet they reject the book. Well, you can just cross them off. They're not genuinely born again. And the Jews, they reject this book. And they don't bear fruit as a result. I mean, I've, I've tried to watch some stuff that the, some of these rabbis come out with, and they are some of the most confused. I mean, you think, what? Turn to the book of Hebrews. Speaking of Jews, we'll go to the book of Hebrews, written to a Jew in the time of Jacob's trouble. Hebrews chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, what we're reading about the vineyard and the, the you know, husbandman, and he's sending you know, different men down there and everything else. He spoke in time past 
by the prophets. Hath in, le in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, Son of God, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom all also he made the worlds. The soul created everything through the body. You know, you say, I put my heart and soul into this painting, but your soul didn't paint the painting. Your body of flesh painted the painting, but you need the soul inside to paint, to be inspired to paint that. That's what happened there with God. God the Father is the soul. He made the world through Jesus Christ. That's what's going on there. But look at verse 3. It's talking about the Son here. Who being the brightness of His glory, calls thy face to shine and we will be saved. Back in the book of Psalms. Hmm. And the express image of His person. Singular. The express image of His person. Now what does that mean? That either means that Jesus Christ is an identical twin, express image, and there have been papists that have taught that. It's funny, the Trinity triplets, they literally teach that all three persons, that's not scriptural, but they teach that there are three persons that they're all identical. That's nonsense. Okay, um, So they're either identical twins or they're separate, you know, some kind of, I don't even know how you would make that. Uh, no, actually what the Bible's teaching is that the image of God the Father is Jesus Christ. He's the body. He's what you see. Right now, you're looking at the body of Brian Denlinger. You're not looking at my soul or my spirit. You can't see them. See how that works? Man is made in the image of God. Man is made after the similitude of God. You look at the body, but you don't see the soul and the spirit. But they're there. Three in one. <sighs> not very hard. And upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Why did he do that? Let's continue. Being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. But And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world... He saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. Glory to God and on earth, peace toward men. Remember Luke chapter 2, when Jesus was born? Let all the angels of God worship him. They were when Jesus was born on the earth. Okay, let's continue here. Um, and of the angels he saith, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. But unto the Son he saith, thy throne... O oh God. Now, if you're a Trinitarian, then you have to make two gods there. Because the Father is speaking, speaking to the Son. He says, Thy throne, O God. Uh, if you're a Bible believer and you believe in the Godhead doctrine, you just say, well, yeah. The different parts of the Godhead can call each other God. They don't ever say gods or separate God or something. It's just God, singular. Because it's one person and it's one God. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. You say, well, it says, therefore God, even thy God. See, Jesus had a God. <laughs> okay, then, then you have a serious heretical problem there, stupid Trinitarian. Up here, he says, um, under the sun he saith, thy throne, O God. And then... Thy God, even thy God, or, or uh, therefore God, even thy God. Well, then that's two different gods, according to Trinitarians. You have to think about that stupid heresy that you people believe in. Okay, no, it's just one God, and the different parts of God can call each other God. That's all that it is there. Verse 10, And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they all shall wax old as doth a garment. And as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. But to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand, here's the key word, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. There's a time frame there. I want you to watch this video until the 54-minute mark. See? I want you to watch this video. Period. 
that means the whole thing. But if I say I want you to watch this video until the 54 minute mark, that means that there's a time frame there. 54 minutes you're supposed to watch and then at 54 minutes and one second you're supposed to stop watching. See? Until refers to a time frame. Verse 14, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? Again, talking about the angels there. But the whole point is, it's until, you see, Jesus Christ is promised a sixth kingdom, 1,000 years on the earth, before we go into eternity. Jesus is on the right hand of God until his enemies are made his, the footstool, here, his footstool. And then after that is done, then you come into eternity. So the mistake that the dean of Ashley, that I showed the comment in the very beginning, the mistake she made is thinking fifth kingdom ends, heaven eternity begins. Not so. And very few people understand this. They'll go amillennial or postmillennial. Amillennial meaning there is no millennial kingdom. That's what the Catholics believe. They believe that they're in the millennial kingdom right now and Christ reigning on the earth is actually the Pope. Vicarious Philly D., you can check me out on that. I'm telling you the truth. And then you have some of the Protestant reform type of people, and they come out with this stupid nonsense heresy of post-millennial teaching, where man sets up a thousand-year uh, reign on the earth, and then Jesus shows up at the end of it, which is absolutely absurd. I mean, man has never been able to run a kingdom for more than about 250 to 300 years. All, all empires fail. How are you going to do a thousand years? Not happening. Okay. Uh, next, let's go to Psalm 2. <clears throat> A very important prophecy here that's referred to in Hebrews chapter 1. And you'll see here again, another one of the attacks, the reason a lot of these people, they'll come out and they'll attack the Lord Jesus Christ. They'll say, well, um, you know, there is no premillennial coming of Christ. That's heresy or whatever. Um, there is no thousand-year reign and things because they're trying to steal. You remember? Uh, here's the vineyard, and I'm going to send my son. And they'll say, there's the heir. Let's kill him so that we can take the inheritance for ourselves. They want that thousand-year kingdom. That's why the you know there's been more wars fought over the city of Jerusalem than any other city on earth throughout history. It's really amazing to think about. Psalm 2 Verses 1 through 12. Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, there you have your new world order, your globalists, your council on foreign relations, your Jesuit order, your Freemasons, your Bilderbergers, your, you know, Club of Rome, World Economic Forum. They all do this. G20 meetings and everything else. Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. <laughs> Such an amazing thing, the God of heaven and earth, and he actually derides people. He mocks people. Hmm. Don't be uh, shocked when a preacher or a real Christian mocks and laughs at the wicked people out there that have no desire for repentance and that mock this book. You mock this book, I will mock you, just like the Lord would do. Verse 5, Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath, and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion, a mountain, a great mountain that he reigns from. The stone which the builders rejected, the same is made the head of the corner. Let us go to the city of the great king, and he will teach us of his ways. It's all in Scripture. It's all through Scripture just hundreds, probably thousands of scriptures to prove what I'm saying, that all tie together, everything ties together. Verse 7, I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Okay, there's a very big difference there between 
the way most people think and the reality of things. Right? God is going to rule on this earth. And God right now, he's letting the transgressors come to the full. The Bible speaks of that. When the transgressors are come to the full, the Antichrist is going to show up to finish off the fifth kingdom. And then Jesus Christ comes back and makes a, you know, he destroys the whole thing, sets up his kingdom on the earth. And when he sets it up, he isn't going to come back and just, you know, kind of come in, you know, kind of gentle and, um, excuse me, I, I really love everybody and I don't want to judge anyone, but, you know, I'm here to bring peace. Is that okay? You know, rod of iron. <clears throat> <clears throat> Remember what the picture was? A wine press? Stomping on the grapes? Smashing the grapes under your feet until the blood of the grapes is coming out? What does Jesus do at the Battle of Armageddon? He comes back on a horse, slays 200 million men with his word. Sharp sword comes out of his mouth. The word of God is like a sharp sword, sharp two-edged sword. <laughs> Kills them. And then he rides down through that mass of uh, grapes, the grapes of wrath, you know. And he comes down through and just smash, 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 smash. Gives the bird a nice, you know, easier time digesting all of that nice stuff, you know. Yeah. Are you sure you believe in the right God? The one that's found in the King James Bible? Or is this all just too much for you and you just, ah, you know, that's what a bloody horrible thing, you know. It always cracks me up when evolutionists, they come out and they say, well, the Bible is just such a bloody, horrible book. What about evolution theory? You know, survival of the fittest and everything else. Wipe out the retarded people and, and whatever else. Let's just get rid of them. They're, they're not evolved enough and, and we should you know, eliminate them from the gene pool and things. Why would you reject war and death and dying if you're an evolutionist? doesn't make any sense. Next, let's go to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. To the New Testament. We'll see some interesting things here. Matthew 13, verse 36 through 50. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. Plenty of those today. The enemy that sowed them is the devil, the harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his, his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Um, again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he hath found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Um, again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but, the bad, but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the, just from among, or sever the wicked from among the just, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. So when God gets the heathen for his inheritance, it isn't just, oh, hey, everybody heathen and everything is, you know, everybody comes on into the kingdom. Hey, there's plenty of room for everyone. No, he doesn't do that. He comes back and he separates. God is a segregationist, okay? True biblical segregationist. Um, keep people separate to keep their culture and their beliefs strong. All right, that's the whole point of true biblical segregation. You can watch my studies on that. Um, it's not a racist type of a thing or whatever else. No, it's say I'm going to keep things segregated, keep things separated. Okay, if you don't do that in your medicine cabinet and your refrigerator and your underneath your sink and whatever and your 
things to clean the toilet out, well, then you're going to have some problems. It's, you know, you practice segregation in your home. You keep different cleaning chemicals and food and uh, essential oils and whatever else and soap. You keep that stuff separate. It's common sense, okay? But Jesus Christ, when he comes back, he gets the heathen for his inheritance, a thousand years on the earth. And then he separates and he says, okay, children of the kingdom, come on in. Children of the devil, down you go. I'm going to send you down into hell for the thousand years. And then after that, then they go into the uh, lake of fire. Matthew chapter 16. Go to Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and they, then he shall reward every man according to his works. Verily I say unto you, there shall be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Hmm. So Jesus Christ comes back and uh, he sets up his kingdom and he separates and he will give every man according to his works. You see, again, one of, the, one of the big things that modern man wants to get rid of, modern man wants to get rid of the fact that there's a coming judgment and nobody escapes the judgment. He said, well, I do because I got saved, so I don't have to go through a judgment. Oh, you're very foolish. Uh, no, actually, you're going to be judged. Now, the outcome of that judgment is going to be different than the outcome of the judgment of the lost. But the fact is, you and I are going to be judged for what we've done. God cares very much about your works, you see. You don't have to work to be saved. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Okay, sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow, like the old hymn says. Actually snowing right now outside here. But the whole point is, God cares about your works and you will be rewarded or you will be judged according to those works. Lost people are judged according to their works. You will be rewarded according to your works. There's no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Romans chapter 8. Sure, you aren't going to have to go to hell for a thousand years or something. There's some that teach that. That's nonsense. All right, Christians are not going to be condemned into going to hell or something. That's stupid. That's purgatory. Essentially, that you have to be burned or something. That's nonsense. All right. Um, but you will suffer, suffer loss. If you spend your time just serving yourself, serving your flesh, and you don't ever do anything for the Lord, you will suffer loss. So there will be some suffering in heaven. You'll realize how much more you could have done for the Lord, how much more you could listen to preaching and teaching than listening to worldly stuff. You need to think about that. Matthew chapter 24. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 24, verse 23. 23 through 39 here. I have my notes over here. That's why I keep looking over that way. If you haven't figured that out. Matthew chapter 24, verse 23. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall uh, false, arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they, lay, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. After the fifth kingdom is ending. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. He's talking about the battle of Armageddon, Revelation 19. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. The Jews there, they're going to be the ones that mourn because they'll realize they rejected their Messiah. They'll see him as the Son of Man and they'll realize that he was the Son of God. 
He's no ordinary man. Verse 31, And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, like we've been reading about, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now learn a parable of the fig tree, when his branch is yet tender, and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. Let me just stop there. You have the parable of the fig tree. The fig tree being a type of Israel. When Israel is re reborn, it's putting forth leaves. You know that summer's nigh. These things are coming to pass. Okay, But it doesn't just say when you see that as a sign. It's all these things. Israel being reborn as a nation is a major prophetic end times sign. But over and above that, you also have all the other things that Jesus is talking about, all the things in the Pauline epistles. There's a lot of prophecies in the New Testament about the end times, and they're all coming to pass perfectly, especially with the mark of the beast and everything else, the technology that's there for that. It's incredible. All right, When you see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. The Lord is coming back. He's coming back soon. You're not going to, most people watching this, you're never going to live to see old age. Okay? You don't have to think about retirement. All right? If you're in your 40s or 50s or whatever else, don't think about retirement. If you're in your 60s, don't think about retirement. It's really something to think about. Okay? Retirement on the earth. Okay? <laughs> um, this isn't really going to be retirement here. This is going to be a wonderful time here. Um, and we'll be in it within... You know, like I did my sermon by 2050 at the latest, you know, I mean, I'm not saying it'll start in 2050. I'm saying we'll be in it in 2050. I firmly believe that. Um, <clears throat> verse 34, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, know not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Um, and new, uh, for as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. There will be a lot of people that get separated. A lot of people are going to find themselves uh, thinking that they were going into the kingdom and they don't make it. So next we're going to go to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25, verse 31 through 34. You could read the whole thing, but we're just, for sake of time, we'll just hit those verses. Matthew 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory. What did we read back in Daniel? Okay. He establishes a throne on the mountain, the mountain, a great mountain that fills the whole earth. And he's the head of the corner, the stone which the builders rejected. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Sixth kingdom. That's what he's talking about. He's saying there to them, I am the king, the king of the Jews. I am here in my capacity to sit upon the throne of David, my father, the sixth kingdom, and I'm going to rule it from Jerusalem. That's what he's talking about. All right, and then he takes the goats there and he casts them down into hell, prepared for the devil and his angels. You can read about that in verse 41 of Matthew 25. You won't go there for sake of time, but go next to Matthew chapter 26, verse 59. <clears throat> 59 through 65. A lot of scripture today, but that's the whole point. I want you to see the scriptures, not just think it's all here. The teachings of Brian Denlinger. I'm a Denlinger, you know, then they right or whatever else. No, it's the scriptures. Uh, Matthew 26, verse 59. Now the chief priests and elders and all the council sought false witnesses or false witness against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet found they none. 
At the last came two false witnesses, and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said unto him, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witness against thee? But Jesus held his peace. And the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God, not even realize he's, he's talking to him, <laughs> that thou tellest uh, whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Are you the Son of God? We see some tie-ins here that you could be the Son of Man, but you can't be just Son of Man and not Son of God. You have to be both. You have to have both titles. <clears throat> Verse 64, Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless, I say unto you, Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Tell us whether you're the Son of God. You will see the Son of Man. Hmm. Jesus is saying the same thing there. He's saying that I'm the same. I'm both titles. I have both titles. See, they could acknowledge that he's the Son of Man. But they said, are you the Son of God? We can see the Son of Man argument, maybe. But are you the Son of God? And Jesus says, yes, I'm the Son of Man. And you'll see the Son of Man, meaning me, sitting at the right hand of God. And look what their reaction is. Verse 65. Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He hath spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now ye have heard his blasphemy. Why would he accuse him of blasphemy? Do you ever think about that? If the Trinity stuff is true, well, then Jesus could be, you know, well, I'm just a separate person than the Father and whatever else. Um, you know, you'll see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power. Why? Because they knew what Jesus was saying, the prophecy there, that the right hand of power, it's God's hand. It isn't that Jesus is sitting over there on his Father's hand or something like that. That's not it. He's saying body is separated from soul until his enemies are made his footstool. It's very deep prophecy type of stuff. But when Jesus identifies himself, yeah, me, you know, the Son of Man that you recognize, I'm going to be seated at the right hand of power. And they said, that's blasphemy. Because you see, Jesus, in his statement, he was saying, I'm the Father. I am God. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. The mighty God, the everlasting Father, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. You see? John chapter 18. John chapter 18, verse 33 through 38. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it thee of me? <laughs> little sarcastic slap in his face. Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Hmm. We well, say, well, see right there, Brian. You just disproved your whole theory. Your whole thesis is thrown out. It doesn't work. My kingdom's not of this world. Jesus has no earthly kingdom. It's not what the text says. Jesus is simply saying, my kingdom is not of this world right now. Else would my servants fight right now. How do you know? Now is my kingdom not from hence. I'm not setting it up right now. It's not from hence, not from here. I'm not doing it right now. That doesn't mean he's not going to have a kingdom. That there will be no earthly kingdom. So don't try to use that verse to overthrow this teaching right here. You'd have to ignore a whole lot of other scriptures if you're going to try to do that. Okay, Jesus Christ has a kingdom, and he is going to set it up physically on the earth. Very important to understand that. Verse 37, Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. 
I came. I'm the son of God. I came as the son of man to set up my sixth kingdom. But they, I came to my vineyard there to get some fruit. And they, they're killing me now. The people there that I've lent the kingdom out to. They're trying to kill me. See how it all works out? Verse 38, Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? That's what most lost people do. What is truth? The more I know, the, the more I know that the less I know, or something. <laughs> all this stuff. This philosophical nonsense of academia. And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all. <laughs> yeah. He just got cornered, put in his place by God manifest in the flesh. And he says, I, I can't find any fault in this guy. You're the ones that have the problem with him. <clears throat> Mark chapter 8. Go to Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8, verse 34. <clears throat> and when he had called the people, when he had called the people unto him with his disciples, also he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, and let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever, therefore, shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. You know the key to making it through what's coming, the end times, is the instruction manual. Right there. Well, brother, I agree, but you know, I <clears throat> I have my AR-15, 20,000 rounds of ammunition. I've been buying survival buckets for 10 years. I know how to put a tourniquet on an arm after there's an injury. I'm able to go off grid. I've been a survivalist. I've been training. I have an underground bunker built. I can do improvised explosive. <laughs> uh, no, it's just a book. It's just a King James Bible. And I see anybody out there, oh, I'm a survivalist. I'm an end-time survivalist. Do you, do you use the King James Bible? Well, no, I use the NIV or whatever other version I want. Bye-bye. I'm not following you for one second. I am not going to follow some dork out there that's using some Vatican version. And the reason I call the new versions Vatican versions is because you read the second Vatican Council, the Ecumenical Council back in the 1960s, and they said, let's make translations with separated brethren. And the NIV was partly done at the University of Salamanca in Spain, the university that trained Ignatius de Loyola, the founder of the Jesuit order back in the 16th century. Proved it. It's in my uh, video, The Real Bible Version Issue Exposed. Proved it. These new versions are made in conjunction with the Vatican. So some guy comes out, oh, he's Holy Spirit led and everything else, and he uses a new version that traces back to the Vaticanus and Sinaiticus manuscripts and, and the Vatican working with the Nestle's text and everything else. Jesuit Cardinal Carlo Maria Martini working in the translation there, it's right in the intro of the Nestle's text. And you want me to believe the Holy Spirit's leading you? No. King James only. Oh no, the, the Holy Spirit can use... No, he can't. No, no, the Holy Spirit's not going to use other versions. He uses one book. Throughout the Old Testament, he used one language, Hebrew. New Testament, Greek. Whole Bible, English. Can you make translations and things? Sure, but does it line up with this? Well, not exactly, then scrap it. It's very simple, it's very simple. Next, let's go to uh, Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22, verse 66. Down through the end there, Luke 22, verse 66 through 71. 
And as soon as it was day, the elders of the people and the chief priests and the scribes came together and led him into their council, saying, Art thou the Christ? Tell us. And he said unto them, If I tell you, ye will not believe. And if I go, I, and if I also ask you, ye will not answer me, nor let me go. Hereafter shall the Son of Man sit on the right hand of the power of God. And there he gets him again. Then said they all, Art thou then the Son of God? And he said unto them, Ye say that I am. And they said, What need we any further witnesses? For we ourselves have heard of his own mouth. Jesus just identified himself as two titles, Son of Man, Son of God. You want to get into the kingdom on earth? Then you believe in the Son of Man. You want to get into heaven when you die? Then you believe in the Son of God. It's just that simple. You know, I think about the old hymn, Son of God and Son of Man, glory and honor, praise, adoration. You know, that's the two titles. And again, when you hear Trinitarians, they come up with this, all these weird things that appear nowhere in Scripture, and then they claim that they're Orthodox. Okay, no, they're not. Um, God, or Jesus was fully man and fully God. Uh, I don't see it. Son of God, son of man. Oh, yeah, that's in there. Um, to say that Jesus was fully man, like I said earlier in the study, that's nonsense. That's blasphemy. Uh, fully man means he had his own body, soul, spirit, separate from the Father. That's blasphemy. God manifest in the flesh. Well, kind of, you know. <laughs> I don't think so. John chapter 5. John chapter 5, verse 17. <clears throat> but Jesus answered them, My father worketh hitherto, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. No, they're two different persons. No, they're one person. And if you say God is my father, then you're identifying yourself as the son of God, making yourself equal with to God. Hmm. Verse 19. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth. And he will show him greater works than these, that ye may marvel. For as the Father raiseth up the dead, and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. For their father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. The stone which the builders rejected. The same as made the head of the corner. Go into eternity. See how it works? Verse 23. That all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. Why? Well, they're the same being. He that honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. The soul sends the body, obviously. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God. Um, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. You see it? He's both. Uh, verse 28. Marvel not at this. For the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice, and shall come forth they that have done good under the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil under the resurrection of damnation. I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. All right? And, you know, again, Trinitarians get all excited. See? Oh, this Father and the Son have different wills. Oh, uh, well, does your soul and your flesh have different wills? Does your soul feel anything? I mean, right now, 
you know, if I go like, oh, hold on there. If I go like this, ow, that hurts. Hurts what? My soul? No, it hurts my flesh. You know, like that. Ow, that hurt my flesh. It doesn't hurt my soul. But yet my soul can feel things that my flesh can't feel. There's sometimes I just feel really down and just, oh man, what's going on? There's some kind of spiritual thing. And my soul can feel very vexed. And it doesn't affect my actual physical, physical flesh. So my Soul can have one will and my flesh can have another will. That's all that it's saying there. It doesn't mean two different persons, two different gods, you know, God beings or something. John chapter 8. John 8 verse 21 through 37. Then said Jesus... Again unto them, I go my way, and ye shall seek me, and shall die in your sins. Whether I go, ye cannot come. Then said the Jews, Will he kill himself? Because he saith, Whether I go, ye cannot come. And he said unto them, Ye are from, from beneath, I am from above. Ye are of this world, I am not of this world. I said therefore unto you, that ye shall die in your sins. For if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. If ye believe not that Jesus is the Father, you'll die in your sins. You don't understand who he is. If you reject that truth. Then said they unto him, Who art thou? And Jesus saith unto them, Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. <laughs> I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. Then they understood not that he spake to them of the Father. Then said Jesus unto them, what ye have, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, right there, then shall ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And he that sent me is with me, the Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. As he spake these words, many believed on him. Um, verse 31, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, again, we'll go back to the Bible, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, uh, How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. The stone which the builders rejected. See how that works. Revelation chapter 1. Two more places to turn to before we go to part 2 of this study. Revelation chapter 1, verse 12 through 18. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and, having, and, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. Okay? That's Jesus Christ. Right there. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. That's what he looks like. You know, and, and it just cracks me up, this, this uh, black uh, Jew movement or whatever else, we're the true Hebrew Israelites and all this, um, and they show him being black, and they say it's like brass, you know. Uh, well, black is not brass, okay? Okay. Um, no, uh, and it's brass that's burning in a furnace. It's bright, it's glowing. His countenance is like the sun when it shines in its strength. 
It's not black. Some people are pretty stupid, but uh, yeah. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. We'll get back to this here in a minute. We'll go back through it. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under for he hath put all things under his feet. When he but when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. In other words, the Father is not including included in that. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. You say, well, see there, the Son is subject to the Father. Duh. Again, there's difference. They're separate persons. Uh, no, that's not what it's saying. Okay, What this is saying is, remember in the book of Hebrews chapter 1, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Okay, what happens after the until is over? Well, then the kingdom is delivered up to the Father. Okay, this is what is going to transition into this study, which will come next. Like I said, this is a huge study. Jesus Christ is sitting at the right hand of the Father until his enemies are made his footstool. 1,000 years on the earth. He becomes, there becomes a great mountain that fills the whole earth. The stone which the builders rejected, the same as made the head of the corner. Right here it is. Okay? Again, let's read it here. Um, verse 25. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. He's going to take over the whole earth with a rod of iron. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. And we're going to see this in the next study. When you read about God, the Lamb, and God, it's one. There's one throne, and it's himself. It's speaking in the singular. It's two different titles, God and Lamb, but it's one. Jesus Christ is separate from the Father in the sense of the body is at the right hand of God right now until his enemies are made his footstool, then starts eternity. Okay? That is what the Bible teaches. The interpretation thereof is sure. Okay? If you're saved, you'll get it. If you're lost, I'm wasting my time, and you're wasting your time as well. Uh, go watch something else. There's plenty on YouTube to watch if you're a lost person. If you're saved and you truly want to know the truth, then uh, this has been a great blessing to you. It's been a great blessing to me. I, I go through these sermons and, you know, I'm writing out all these notes and everything. And, okay, Lord, show me what your word says. I'm not looking at commentaries. I'm not going to, well, what does Brother Ruckman say? Or what does uh, so-and-so, Oliver B. Green and D.L. Moody and yeah, whatever. I don't care. What does the word say? And I do word studies and I look and I say, okay, what, where does Son of Man show up? What about Son of God? What about kingdom? What about, and you look at the key words in a study that you're trying to do and that will show you. The Lord will guide you through the scriptures and he'll guide you into all truth. It's amazing. All right, that's what I've done for all of these years. And I know a lot of you do it as well. It's the right method to do. So, in conclusion here for part one of this very lengthy study, there are two kingdoms that are coming. We are in the fifth kingdom right now. I firmly believe that. I don't believe we're waiting for the fifth kingdom. I believe we're in it. The Roman Catholic Church, the Roman is the iron. The Catholic is the clay. Okay? And they're trying to merge the two. And they're saying, we can't take the iron legions of Rome anymore and conquer nations. We'll just, we'll say we're sending in missionaries. You know, and we'll, uh, Put leaders in, we'll install leaders in positions of power that are papal knights or that we've trained. 
so-and-so is a faithful Catholic. He'll do what we tell him to do. Oh, he's stepped out of line? Kill him. We'll have a, a regime change or something, a military coup or whatever. Part weak, part strong. That's what we're dealing with in the fifth kingdom. All right. The Lord is going to come and he's going to put an end to it and he will set up his kingdom. And you say, but it said that back there in Daniel that it, there'd be no end. There isn't an end, okay, to his throne. What it's an end of is the earth. The earth ends, but his kingdom does not. The kingdom, they come up against the kingdom and the Lord just says, no, there's no war here. Fire comes down from heaven, devours them. We'll see this in the next study. And boom, it's wiped out, but the kingdom goes now to the great white throne judgment. The throne doesn't end, you see. He just has to make the heathen his inheritance. And again, one of the most amazing things, you say, it doesn't really make sense anymore. Why, or to me, why would God set up a kingdom on the earth, the sixth kingdom, only to let the devil out at the end, if you know the scriptures, Revelation chapter 20. He looses him out of his prison for after the thousand years, and he goes out to deceive the nations, and they come up to Jerusalem. Why would he do that? Well, because he's given the heathen for his inheritance, you see. He's saying, I'm going to give man one more chance to prove if he's going to follow me or not, and to show how corrupt man is. There's none good. They're all gone out of the way. And if you're saved, you're not even offended by that. I'm not offended by the Lord saying, none of you are good, including you, Brian Denlinger. I said, yeah, you know me, Lord. I'm not, well, I just can't imagine you would say that I'm not good. Are you kidding me? I know I'm not good. Not a problem. And you know the same, too, you bad little, you know, wicked sinner out there, <laughs> even the redeemed ones. Um, so that's going to be it for this study. Uh, we're going to go into the next one now, um, take a little break here, then we'll come back in the next video. Uh, it's been a real interesting study. So we will see you in the next video. Thank you for watching.